the Farmers Footprint docuseries and nonprofit, bringing consumer and corporate support to farmers prepared to transition from chemical farming to regenerative agriculture and create a healthier future. He's going to be talking with Yvonne Chenard, who I think needs no introduction. We are so lucky to have him here. I think if there's one person working to change the way that companies are operating um, to make climate their central mission, this is the one. He's an American mountain climber, environmentalist, passionate activist, itinerant adventurer, and iconoclastic outdoor industry businessman. Um, Patagonia has been around for decades and long known for its environmental and so social initiatives, and we're really excited to hear more about that and more about their recent announcement in December around their new mission focused around climate change, around the work that they've done, putting their money where their mouth is, through the regenerative organic certification, through the money they're giving to grassroots organizations. I think there's just so much to learn in this session. So with no further ado, I'm going to get, get off stage and let you guys learn that and let us all hear it. So thank you so much. I'm not letting you off that easy. If this man has inspired you in the last few decades to get outside, stand up and give this man a round of applause. <laughs> Woo! We got together last week to talk about what we were going to talk about, and one of my closing questions was, you know, in, in the darkness that we live in, are you optimistic for the light? And um, you described yourself as a pessimist, and I hope that I just put a whole bunch of cracks in <laughs> that pessimism. Uh, it's a real honor to be here with all of you. Um, Yvonne and I, uh, last week, as we got to know each other a little bit, I think started to realize that all of us coming from all these different angles, you have uh, ultimately a metal worker. You got to see his forge last week and where he started in 1957, which was 62 years ago, walking the walk for six decades. And then a doctor who's walked for a very short amount of time compared to that. And we both find ourselves in one spot and one discussion around this vulnerable point, this tipping point that we sit at in human history. And all of you showed up right now with us. And so the chat today is less between two human beings and more, I, I hope, resonating through all of you and all of the networks and influence, influenced people that you guys impact that to create a human dialogue tonight that will change the direction of our industry not because we're the most consumptive or the most destructive, but because you guys are some of the most powerful influencers in the mind of the consumer. And both Yvonne and I agreed that the consumer is ready for change. So Yvonne, I, I want to start out with this, this poignant moment. I've started a number of companies, and whenever you put your blood, sweat, and tears into something, um, it, it takes an emotional, spiritual toll and there's, a, there's an impact that happens over a lifetime. And all of us, I think, have this thought in our back of our mind that we are moving towards a legacy or some body of work that we can point to to say, this is good. Very few of us are ready to blow that up at the end of a long walk. And I'm very curious to, for you to describe your journey in the last year to the point where you changed the mission statement on a company that's been as prominent and leader in such a leadership role of integrating humanity with nature. You changed directions in, in December and January. Can you tell us how that happened? Well, uh, I mean, I'm in, I've been in business for a long time. And as you know, every business changes over, you know, a, a business that's a million dollars is a different business than one that's 10 million. And so you have to, I believe in evolution, believe it or not. Some <laughs> people don't, but, um, and it, every company has to evolve. And I, uh, in, just in the last 20 years or so, things have gotten so grim with the forecast about climate change and everything that I felt like our mission statement, our old mission statement, w needed to be updated. And I, 
I asked myself, why am I still in business after all these years? And uh, why don't I just cash out and, you know, get a house at Caesar World? And <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I, I've always felt like um, all of us have resources of some kind and we need to do good with them. My resource is owning this company. That's why I'm hanging in there, but I'm not doing enough, particularly about climate change, which, you know, is, is this thing hanging over everything that we do. It's, uh, we're talking about, you know, the future of life on earth. And uh, so we decided to change our mission statement to say, we're in business to save our home planet. Very simple, everybody can remember it. But what does that mean for us? And what does that mean for my 2,500 employees around the world? And so it changes their jobs completely. And it changes our focus on a, as a business. And for instance, uh, you know, we've been using organically grown cotton for 20 years or so. It doesn't do the world any good. All it does is cause less harm. So we started a program this year of uh, growing cotton in India in a regenerative way. So no tilling, using cover crops, using compost. So in other words, going beyond organic. And we started with 100 farmers and small farmers, you know, an acre, an acre and a half. And, this, and we convinced them to try doing it in a regenerative style. Now, this, these, are, these are farmers where 30,000 of them committed suicide in the last few years because of crop failure. And a lot of it was, you know, coming from GMO seeds and stuff. So they had a complete success. Um, we're giving them a 10% bonus on their cotton. They're growing um, cover crops like turmeric, where they're uh, getting a double income. And you know, these are people that make $1,500 a year maximum. And so it was a total success. Next year, we're doing 650 farmers that are signing up. And so, you know, our first products from that cotton will be uh, these stand-up shorts, which is a kind of iconic product that we started out doing years ago, and that'll come out next spring. So that's, that's kind of, um, you know, I'm not interested in giving money to friends of the polar bear. If you want to save the polar bear, we have to save the planet, right? And, uh, you know, we're extirpating all the large mammals, and guess what? We're large mammals. <laughs> so, that's our focus. Is, is, uh, that's why I'm, I'm pretty excited about um, what we're doing. It, I'm pretty excited about talking to every single one of our employees and saying, how does a mission statement change your job? And uh, it's amazing what the difference it made. In fact, if we really want to combat climate change, all of you that own a company out there really should change your mission statement to saving the planet. David Brower said there's no business to be done on a dead planet. We're speeding towards that so fast from the, from the medical side. Um, we have a stunning look from just the biology side. You mentioned that we're, we're just large mammals and mammals of course are high on that food chain. It doesn't matter if you're a plant eater or a carnivore, we're still high on that food chain just by the volume of consumption that we do as a large mammal. And right now we see this acceleration towards the collapse of our species at a pace at which our smaller species, the insects, the microbiome, the bacteria, the fungi, are disappearing at a rate of about one species every 20 minutes now. And so over this short talk, we'll lose two species to total extinction on this little blue earth that we live on. And so on the human toll side, as a physician, I've found my way to the story of regenerative agriculture in discovering that my chemotherapy research that was happening as of a decade ago uh, was a chasing after the wind when you start to see that our biggest epidemics of cancer are in our children. 
uh, brain tumors in children and the like, never heard of before in the, in the 1950s and 60s when you started Patagonia, now it's an epidemic. We're now looking at reproduction as this complete crisis for our species. We may have one in three males with infertility, one in four women with infertility trouble now. And at this current pace, we're looking at 60 to 70 years left as a species. And yet you all showed up right now, which is pretty interesting. It's kind of odd that 7 billion people would show up. One thing that I see in Yvonne is somebody with a deep soul that has remained profoundly authentic through your journey. And your authenticity, I think, has overcome a lot of the naysayers who say, who say no, there's no such thing as climate change and the like. Can you t tell us some of the stories in six decades of being an outdoorsman and, and a conquistador out there in the wilderness, wilderness as you've described yourself, what have you seen that proves to you that climate change is indisputable? Well, I used to do a lot of ice climbing. Uh, a lot of the first ascents that I did on ice climbs around the world, they're gone. They're, they're all melted out. Um, I was fishing in Russia a few years ago in June in Arctic. Salmon fishing in Arctic Russia. I mean, this is on the Arctic Circle in June. And it got, the temperatures got into the high 90s. And uh, I caught a salmon and I released it and he didn't move. He just laid next to me in the water gasping for air. He had no energy left and, the, you know, for salmon and trout, if the temperature gets up to about 75 degrees Fahrenheit, it's over. And the, the water temperature was about 74 degrees. I mean, that is real close to being absolutely lethal for that whole river system. That same year, temperatures at the, at the base camp on Mount McKinley got into the 90s. That's 14,000 feet. Um, you really see it in the high latitudes, you know, in Arctic and, and the subarctic and stuff. That's where it really hits you. Um, I mean, there's, there's no disputing it. It's, it's really in your face. And I don't know. I, I, uh, when, when we decided to do this new mission statement, we had to decide, well, what as a company can we do? I'm not interested in working on symptoms. So as a company, what is the best thing that we could do? Well, the best thing is we use a lot of agricultural products in making our clothes. And so the number one thing is to support regenerative organic agriculture. I think that's the best thing we can do I mean, it's a win-win deal. It, it, you know, it creates more, more food per acre. It employs people, captures carbon, and it makes more nutritious food. I mean, you know, 2012, Stanford University came out with a study that said there's no difference between the, the nutrition aspect of organic foods and non-organic. That's a shocker, right? When you go to the supermarket, you buy your organic foods, there's no nutritional difference. The only thing is that it's missing all the pesticides and stuff. But that, the problem is probably that carrot is grown in Baja California in factory farms and in between uh, crops, they're just putting in soil amendments. They're not replacing all the micronutrients that are essential for health. And I'm convinced that if you do it regeneratively and organically, both, that you'll end up with far more nutritious food. I mean, the kicker is just taste it. Taste a, taste a carrot in a supermarket that's organic and taste one that's not organic. If they taste the same, they have the same nutrition. Dan Barber, you know, and 
and others agree with me that the better something tastes has the more nutrition, has all those little polyphenols and micronutrients. You know, grape, Cabernet Sauvignon grapes grown in Modesto sell for $800 a ton. 200 miles further north, Cabernet Sauvignon grapes sell for up to $30,000 a ton. What's the difference? The difference is micronutrients. And that is a study that really gets me fired up in the morning. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur and I see opportunity there. Um, we've, we've started testing some of our products for total nutrients and uh, I'm convinced that a little tiny wild strawberry that's this big has more nutrients than an organically grown one that's that big. That big strawberry is probably hydroponically grown, no soil whatsoever. That's wrong. And um, anyway, I, that's what gets me excited. That I, I wanna test and prove that, that, you know, the guy who grows the best infidel grapes in California, his roots go down 40 feet. He never has to water them. He can't even put compost on them because they'll never get down to the roots. So he has a foliar sp spray in the springtime and his grapes are phenomenal. And I, I think there's a direct connection between the length of the roots and the total nutrients that it pulls up. Uh, I've heard of some tests on olive trees. You know, olive oil is really good for polyphenols, which really feeds your gut biome. And I heard of some 800 year old trees and they tested the polyphenols in there and it's off the chart compared to regular olive oil. Well, we heard of a source of olive oil in Palestine, 3000 year old trees. Well, see an opportunity there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wanna bring this to you guys as, as a poignant you know, circle back as to what he just said in that um, 2012, he mentions, you know, we already knew that organic was not returning a higher nutrient load for our consumers than non-organic. Uh, that, was, that was six years ago, and we haven't seen a new movement in the labeling industry yet to really help us accelerate past that. And so while uh, I, I applaud, as you all have this evening, the progress towards orga the organic movement, um, it was shocking for me to go on the farms with this farmer's footprint journey over the last two years to find out that the soils on our organic farms in this country are often more depleted and damaged than our chemical grown foods. And it's because of over tilling and it's because of poor soil management uh, and a lack of education to the farmers who are really have, have their heart in it, they have their mind in it, they have their body and soul into those pieces of land. And we are not providing the education or the consumer avenue for them to advance their technologies and their sciences around their soil uh, to bring this home. And so it was, I went out trying to think, you know, we've got, you know, this six or eight percent of the, of the country starting to buy organic as an exclusive. And that's super exciting. We must be so close to the tipping point. And to go and find out that we are nowhere near a tipping point for planet Earth because our gold standard right now in the grocery store is not working for planet Earth. It is not going far enough. And if we wait for our legislative movements, you all, as well as us up here, know very well we will die as a species. We will wait the next 16, 17 years for sure. And over that time, we will see the march of our children's health crash. To put this 2012 one in, in perspective from a physician standpoint is that the children in my clinic in 2012 came in with an autism rate about one in 88 children. Now, with this march of organic and the march of this industry, and you guys, is, I, I would imagine almost every brand in here is new since the 2012, a few of you being uh, you know, some of our, our forerunners, but this industry has exploded over these last six years. And in that six years, we've gone from one in eight, 88 children to one in 36 children with autism. We're on course to be at one in three children with autism in the United States by 2035 which with our current legislative patterns will be about two presidents that we have left uh, before we see one in three children with autism. And I think you make such a poignant point
point about there is no company that's going to sell on a sick and dying planet. There is no company that's going to thrive in that space with one in three children so injured neurologically that they're not going to be able to, to be producers in the society. And you've got two, of the, two out of that three trying to produce just enough to support the one and all the resources they need to get back to a neurologic function and the, and the like. And so we stand at this precipice. And I am really enthralled after being on your campus last week of some of the things you said that I think it was the first time I've heard a corporate leader step up with words that were in line with this desperate moment that we're in as a nation and as a developing world. You said, if we can't figure out how to make a coat in the next 10 years that you can put back in your garden to make the planet Earth healthier, we'll just stop making coats. I've never heard that from a CEO. I've never heard that from a founder of a company. I've never heard somebody say, we're just going to blow up my, my 60 year journey in, in being a front runner in this industry. And we're just going to stop doing that. And instead you said you were going to do something else, which was, was sell food. So tell us about your journey into Patagonia provisions and how you got into the food industry. Well, I've been interested in food all my life. Uh, and uh, I do most of the cooking at home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, kind of being an entrepreneur, you're always sticking these ideas in the back of your head, and at some point they erupt. <laughs> and I thought, this is a good time to do that. And uh, I really believe, you know, we need a revolution. The only revolution we're likely to have is in agriculture. It solves tremendous number of the world's problems. I mean, you know, you have around the world, you have unemployed young men right now that are joining gangs or joining Al Qaeda because they don't have a job. Well, are we all going to train them to work on their computer or something? No, they're not. The only, you know, all the jobs are being eliminated with robots and technology. The only jobs that are going to be available is small scale farming. And I can tell you, there are so many young people around the world that are dying to get their hands in the dirt and farm, but not the way their parents farm. So, I mean, I, I want a revolution. In fact, I'm, I'm sharpening the guillotines in my blacksmith shop right now. <laughs> So that's, that's what really gets me excited. And it, it's a win-win-win situation. It really is. And I, I just want to be part of that. And, you know, I, I, we've been working. I mean, Zach here knows all about the gut biome. He should be telling you all about it. But, um, you know, our gut biome is depleted by 60% compared to hunter-gatherers. I was reading uh, Charles Massey's book, and he's an Australian professor and farmer. Great book. He studied uh, a tribe in Africa, hunter-gatherers. They have between 80 and 100,000 different things, choices on a daily basis to eat. He says, when you sit down with a steak, a baked potato, and a salad, you're starving yourself. You know, there's a different nutrients in kale than there is in spinach. And that tribe has no cancer. Well, why isn't the Cancer Society out studying that tribe instead of trying to find a pill that they can sell that cures cancer? You know, Zach was, was saying about how we're taking all these animals along with us. We're taking the bees. Well, what's wrong with the bees? Well, they're getting viruses and stuff. Well, what's wrong with them? Well, we're taking bees to almond orchards, and they're feeding on almond blossoms, and then we take them to another almond orchard, and another almond orchard. They're not getting a diversity of diet. Their gut biome is in the same shape ours is. And, and then, you know, your children are going to have, start out not with a 100% gut biome, they're going to start out with a 30% gut biome, and their children with a 20% gut biome. There, there are 
researchers at UCLA who studied gut biome who say we have 20 years left of immunities. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're talking about, we need a Pearl Harbor. I mean, I, I lived during the Second World War and we all grew victory gardens. We didn't have any meat to eat except us French Canadians. We ate horses, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and you know there was no sugar there was everybody knuckled down and we all worked together and got the job done and that's that's how serious the problem is right now it's it, it's so poignant uh, all of the elements you just mentioned and i think that it's an opportunity for all of you to take a look at your companies and think about its impact or its role in a cooperative relationship to the microbiome. Uh, the, it's been a catchphrase that's become super popular in lay press as well as in the medical literature in the last five years. Uh, and yet, if you ask a physician or any consumer, the, the understanding of what the microbiome is, is missing. And so, quick primer, bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites are kind of your big four categories. And the amount of biology represented on Earth by this microbiome dwarfs anything else that we can see with our eyes around us. Uh, it dwarfs the volume of big animals and big mammals that we, we consume every day, the poultry industry, the likes. The, the microbiome, just to give you a sense of its diversity in, in an ideal situation, if we would just stop killing it for a moment, the bacteria alone get all the credit, right? When we start to think about microbiome, y'all are thinking probiotics. Probiotics will deliver three species, maybe seven species. There's a few on the market where they'll brag 24 species. In an ideal situation, just the bacteria in your gut are, are representing 30 to 40,000 species. Don't be fooled by the supplement industry and its efforts to micromanage an ecosystem of 30,000 bacteria by giving billions of, of, of replications of just a few species. It's a chasing after the wind in the way in which Mother Earth would do it. And then that's to disregard five million species of fungi. We walk into our grocery stores and we know we're doing good if we got like oyster mushrooms in addition to the, the, the other two, the button mushrooms and your, and then you see a shiitake and you're like, oh man, I'm gonna pay a lot of money when I check out of this grocery store. And so we can see three or four or five species of, and it's five million species of fungi on Mother Earth. There are 300,000 species of parasites. We don't even know how many species of viruses there are. But we do have a good sense in these last couple of years of the fact that there are somewhere around 10 to the 31 viruses on Earth. That's a one with 31 zeros after it. And we created a public health movement to create a vaccine against one of those, and we call it the flu vaccine because fortunately the other 10 to the 31 were safe for us. We don't understand the microbiome is the foundation of life. And so as we start to talk about regenerative agriculture, I want you guys to realize every supplement or food item that you guys produce is for most of your consumers, the closest they will come to nature today. And if that's the case, have you worked hard enough to get enough nature into your product? You know, if, if, there's, if there's at least five billion old microorganisms in a teaspoon of living topsoil, nature doesn't screw around. It feels like it's absolutely essential to have those five billion microorganisms. Not four billion, but five billion. Nature's perfect. It's just, you know, it doesn't waste energy. It doesn't, you know, does it just for fun. It's essential. As an endocrinologist, one of the things that we're trained in is uh, endocrinology is the hormones that, that govern our body. And one thing we're trained into at nauseum is the concept of a feedback loop. And the feedback loop of the microbiome into, into your, your customers has to do with all of these tens of thousands of bacteria, all the fungi, parasites and the rest, creating nutrient loops 
between the gut and your liver, your gut and your brain, creating these feedback loops that are not just nutrient delivery systems, but they're actually literal electrical currents running through your body of information. And if we think about creativity and our desperate need for it right now, what if every corporate leader, every founder of a company was willing to have the creativity to say, I'm gonna throw out my entire production line of the last six decades if we can't make it perfect and we're gonna create a new line of stuff, whatever it is that's good for Mother Earth. What does that look like as a feedback loop? And I wanna do something for all of us today is to acknowledge that plastic and carbon and all these things are not waste products. We should not make political campaigns against carbon products like plastic. Plastic is not the enemy. The enemy is the lack of creativity that went into an industry that didn't think that maybe Mother Earth had created every molecule in that plastic and it would want it back. We interrupted the feedback loop and we're doing it in our own products in so many ways. We do it with sugar. Sugar is an endpoint of energy. It does not give back to the organism that's gonna consume it. And so we need to rethink sweeteners and we need to rethink herbs that would give the impression of sweetness on the tongue without any sugar in that product. We need to go so far beyond where we are right now and we need to do it so desperately fast. It's utterly heartbreaking to be in my clinic right now because I'm full of uh, you know, middle-aged adults and teenagers with autoimmune disease. I'm full of children with autism. I'm ch full of lots of young teenagers with extreme anxiety disorders, attention deficit disorders, and we're putting them on speed, Ritalin. We're putting them on drugs that, that take away their creativity. And so when you think about the microbiome and you think about the nutrients that Yvonne is is charging into with Patagonia provisions to say, what if we get the best thing out there in nature and deliver to, to that kid who's got a school lunch, uh, who just unpacked what his mom put in there. What if the nutrients there connected that kid to a micronutrient that created a food feedback loop for a moment that inspired an inter interaction between a, a microbiome, a bacteria, and the enteric endocrine cell in his gut that just created a surge of serotonin that created a spark in his head, and that kid will create the revolution that we need in the next 10 years. <laughs> Yvonne, I, want, I wanted you to tell us about the young people that you see getting motivated by your products and, and really by your whole concept of getting outdoors. Are the young people getting as engaged as they need to be? Um, I mean, they're our only hope, really. I mean, all of us in this room, we're, we're not going to do the things that we really need to do, the hard things. It, it's, you know, it's the young people that took down Diane Feinstein the other day. <laughs> it's, they're the ones, you know, I, I mean, the, the last election, which was just two years ago, two and a half years ago. Climate change was a non-issue. You know, Hillary Clinton probably said two sentences about it. It was a non-issue. They just did a, a poll recently in five states and they polled uh, voters and they said it's their number one priority is climate change. And you know, it, if you've got politicians going to run for president like Beto O'Rourke, who's put climate change as number five in his priority, don't vote for him. Vote for only for politicians who put climate change as number one. It's, it's uh, with, with young people, they're scared to death. And they're not scared about all the things that we're afraid of. I mean, you know, personal security is what all of us are all, our number one priority. Well, forget about that. That's not theirs. Theirs is climate change because they're inheriting this mess. And they wanna do something about it, which is great. 
And so we've got a, a couple seconds left with you. And I want to come back to something that our science team has discovered through our products over the last few years, which is that at the basis of all life is communication. Uh, cellular communication between the microbiome and human health has become my area of expertise and it has inspired me beyond anything I could imagine because we can see cancer cells respond to communication, we can see damaged cells respond to communication and heal at a rate that we just didn't even know possible in medical science because we've never considered human health outside of a petri dish. We've never considered human health in, in its integration into the greater nature around us and when we plug in we heal fast and we heal completely. We cure, we don't manage chronic disease when we are in touch with Mother Earth. And that inspires me to a moment of hope that in this death throes of our species and in fact biology on Earth right now, Mother Earth has a plan to heal faster and it's gonna come down to our ability to communicate to fix the problems fast enough that we get to stay in the body that we could see our grandchildren go on to thrive and start companies smarter than the ones that frankly you or I have started. Companies that will put us out of business because they better because we are not clean enough, we are not sustainable enough, we are not inspiring enough to get there. And so I hope that we get to see our grandchildren sitting around that entrepreneurial table with great ideas erupting in their heads. And so thank you for that image, Yvonne. And one more round of applause. And so let's keep the communication going. Um, come by the Patagonia booth, come by the Restore booth. Let's engage as business leaders as well. And uh, we have a communication network and we'd love to put it into the, the products you make. Let's, let's get communication from Mother Nature as a concept, as an ingredient into life itself. And if you're not doing it with your feet in the dirt, then let's do it through human inspiration to go out together and push harder. And let's think about abandoning our companies if necessary to get to a cleaner earth fast enough that 2035 sees a, a real revolution. That, that D-Day is time and I have a feeling this guy's gonna be at the head of the charge. Thank you. Well. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank well, you. Well, you know, uh, I'll tell you a little story before I We're leave. We're standing up right now. Uh, so. <laughs> when, when I was a kid, like 17, 18, I used to go down to Mexico a lot. And in those days, you got the turistas, and you got really, really sick. And I never took any antibiotics or flagell or anything. I would take a glass of water, put some charcoal in it, some salt, drink it, and then I'd erupt all over it. <laughs> and since then, I've been working on my gut biome. <laughs> I drink out of every river I fish in. And uh, I've had Giardia twice, and now I don't get it anymore. <laughs> I eat out of bazaars in Afghanistan, off the streets, and, and I, think, I think I got a pretty good biome. It's big anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one bit of advice, I, I was talking to Emery, Emery Meyer, who's uh, a real, he wrote, uh, the Mind-Gut Connection, a good book on the gut biome. I asked him what you can do. He said, well, you can't do much. You can't take supplements, but you could eat as varied diet as you possibly can, mostly vegetables, eat very little meat. And when you go to a salad bar, eat everything in the salad bar, except the marshmallows, okay? <laughs> but, you know, take, take a little bit of everything. And uh, when I walk by, a, Rose, like a rose hip, rose hips in a rose bush. I grab one, I eat it. In other words, graze. That's the key. Absolutely. So that's my advice to you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I would ask you guys to do one thing for us.
I would ask you guys to do one thing. It's the most powerful means of communication I've discovered, and I would ask you each to hug at least three people in this room you've never met before before you walk out, and let's start a new revolution. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to meet you. You're welcome. Truly. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, everybody, we are very close. We are very, very close to being able to release you for a reception in the back of the room. We just need a few minutes to set up for that. So if you guys can just give us two more minutes of attention, we will release you for drinks and snacks. I promise. Can we have everyone just sit down for two minutes and can Laura Dickinson and Catherine DiMatteo join me on stage? We just need two more minutes, and then I promise I will not ask you this again, except for at 6.45 after drinks. Do we have Catherine? Ooh, that helps. See, try to walk around now. <laughs> okay, everybody, um, if we have Catherine DiMatteo, she's probably chatting with someone, but we just, here she is. Okay, everybody, we're about to have a reception. To close out the day, I hope you all stay for the reception, the film screening that we have. We'll start that a bit late, probably around um, 6.45, 6.50. But before we do that, um, I just want to take some time to say thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for having these conversations with us. Um, there were so many important themes today. Um, it, a few things that I've heard, we've got to tie climate to the mission, break it out of its silo, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Set goals that scare you and then figure out how to get there after. Um, keep the context in mind. Take a step back every once in a while and remember why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and don't do it alone. Bring your value chain in the game. Bring your suppliers, bring your partners. Um, and, and that's how you can get there. And I want to reference that tomorrow from 10.15 to about 11.30, we have free consultations. If you come to Orange County, room three and four, you will be able to talk to experts and answer any questions you have about your climate goals. So please come to that. You can check our website. It's tomorrow, Orange County, three and four, 10.15 to 11.30. Um, I want to give the two of you an opportunity to say some last words too. I think the only last words I want to say are to thank Aaron for putting this day on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, I, this is a, yeah. I mean, this is a huge endeavor, and um, it just resonated. Uh, uh, what she said, set goals that scare you. Aaron, coming into this industry a year, wait, is this a year and a half, two years now? A year and a half. A year yeah. and a half ago, not knowing any of us and us giving her this to get her arms around was a huge challenge that could scare anyone. And she stepped up and the class and the excellence she executes with every day just is, has us all in awe. So we are very fortunate to have a dedicated team with Aaron and also Caitlin in the back. There are only two full-time people, plus Catherine and Lisa and I working on this. And um, it's really wonderful to see what Aaron and Caitlin put so much into every day. So thank you. Thank you. Now it's time for Catherine to insult me. No. I'm only going to thank all of you for being here, for being our inspiration, for driving us to do what we feel this industry and our community has to do together. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all for listening. Thank yeah. you all for participating. Thank you for talking to each other. And uh, let's go out. Get it yes. done. It's Mardi Gras now, too. So. Yeah, building on let's go out and get it done. Let's start now over the drinks. Let's let the good times roll. Let's celebrate. Let's have great conversations. Um, and let's get it started now. Let's get to work. That's a great message to end on. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Laura. Thank you, everybody. All right. Oh, my God.